So who was powerful and significant in Elizabethan times then? So I'm going to go over these key things and if you've got a question about, you know, what was important about these different things, you can include a summary of all of them really. So Parliament, basically, just like Parliament is today, it was made up of the House of Lords and the House of Commons. But it was much less powerful than the Parliament we have today. The Queen ran the country in those days. Elizabeth I was the most powerful person in England and she made sure that absolutely everybody knew that. The Parliament, though, did have influences over taxes. So it decided how much tax you'd have to pay and it was also responsible for passing laws. Okay, so they, they were two significant things. the passed laws and they also collected in taxes. But the Queen could decide how often she wanted to call Parliament. She didn't have to meet Parliament if she didn't want to. She did meet Parliament, you know, consistently though, she really did. But basically she would listen to them and then she decided how much advice she'd take from Parliament. That was the idea, that's what she would decide on. The most important part of the Elizabeth I era in terms of power and politics was definitely the Privy Council. So this is responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the country and she met them every day. So what happened was if she went in pro on progresses to other palaces, the Privy Council went with her. Because if something major was happening, she couldn't say, oh, I'll wait and see you when I come back because it took a long time to travel in those days. So these people, these 12 men, went round the country with Elizabeth to wherever she was going. These people were Elizabeth's main advisors as well. And obviously people who were on the Privy Council were people like Robert Dudley, Cecil and Walsingham and uh, William Cecil and uh, uh, Francis Walsingham were basically her secretaries of state at different times during her reign so they were like a second in command so they really helped her to decide things that should happen. She had to appoint as well the most powerful landowners so the Duke of Norfolk was also on there even though she couldn't stand him and he couldn't stand her but the idea would be is because he was a strong Catholic landowner it was good to keep your enemies close she was really keen on doing that and they could deal with any issue that arose. Military affairs, foreign affairs, problems over religion, about the Queen's security. It was absolutely essential that the Privy Council, you know, discuss those major, major issues with her. And if the Privy Council agreed on something, because of the 12 powerful men that used to meet with Elizabeth, it was pretty difficult for her to say no. She could still say no if she wanted, but it was pretty difficult for her to say no to them. That was a real problem. And the council was led, as I said before, by a secretary of state. And the people in the Elizabeth's reign were obviously, as I said before, Cecil and Walsingham. Now also in Elizabethan England, they didn't have police like we have today, but they did have people called justices of the peace. And what they do is they ensure that law and order is kept. So they're just like, a modern, like our modern police force really. And there could be local gentry. And the idea is if you were a justice of the peace, you might obviously rise in power and things. You could move up to being in the nobility and things like that. And if you wanted to like enforce something like a death sentence, you'd need more than one justice of the peace to actually make the decision. And that was significant because obviously, you know, it's such a powerful job to have that. You had to have more than one person deciding on sentences like that. And the Lord Leave Tenants, now these were even higher than the justices of the peace. And they could move up to be in the Privy Council even if they were really good Lord Leave Tenants. And they took responsibility for a certain area of Elizabethan England, okay, so it was like split up into different areas, just like it is in counties now, and basically Lord Lieutenants would look after that area. They were involved in settling disputes and collecting taxes, that was one of their major, major jobs, and they also had to raise the, an army if the Queen needed one. They could become, as I said before, privy councillors, but most importantly, they had great power and influence in Elizabethan England. So this is how the whole of England was set up. And finally, the Royal Court. Now, this is strange, really, but the Royal Court was around, around about a 1,000 people and it went from the highest in the land to the lowest in the land. So the people who were like the servants and the cooks were part of the Royal Court, but also members of the Privy Council and the, the noblemen, like, you know, obviously Duke of Norfolk and things like that. And wherever Elizabeth was, the Royal Court went. So when she went on her progresses to Hampton Court and different places like that, the Royal Court went with her. So the gov ladies and waiting and government officials were all part of this and it was basically the Privy Council who had to meet her every day wherever she was in the Royal Court to discuss matters with her. And the important thing about the Royal Court was is everybody wanted to be part of it because it was a really powerful 
powerful thing if you were in the royal court then obviously you could get some power and influence and you could rise if you got banished from the royal court then you were living in disgrace so that's the th people who were powerful in elizabethan england and how the structure of elizabethan england worked Thank you.